Hello and welcome to this beginner tutorial. I'm going to teach you the Tunisian honeycomb stitch, a simple textured stitch consisting of alternating Tunisian simple and purl stitches. And while we do that, you can make either a napkin or a dishcloth. For a dishcloth, I highly recommend this self-striping worsted weight cotton by Estelle. It makes a thick, sturdy dishcloth. Dishy is a very economical choice and it's a little lighter weight and quite soft, but any worsted 100% cotton will work, including Bernat Handicrafter or Sugar and Cream by Lily. This is a dishcloth worked in Estelle suds, and you can see the striping of the yarn really sets off the honeycomb stitch pattern. Honeycomb stitch lies perfectly flat with no curling on the edges. If you want to make a napkin instead, I recommend a fingering weight cotton. Hobie makes numerous of these that are great for napkins, with my favorites being the Sultan yarns. But if you don't feel like waiting for a mail order from Denmark, use any fingering or light sport weight you can find, including maybe this unusual self-striping yarn by Chopelle. A quick note on gauge, I like a smallish dishcloth around 17 centimeters square. With the slightly lighter weight dishy, I would use a five and a half millimeter hook and probably add one additional stitch. With the other cottons, a six millimeter hook and the instructions as written should make a good size. But do check out that size, it might be a little small for you. A Tunisian hook is one that allows you to accumulate all the stitches on the hook. I have a short cord on this one so the stitches don't fall off. And it's a six millimeter size because I'll be using the Estelle Suds yarn. For the napkin, I would use a four and a half millimeter hook. As with most crochet projects, start with a slip knot and then make a foundation chain. For the dish cloth, I chain 27 times, 28 if I'm using dishy with the 5.5 millimeter hook. For the napkin, chain approximately 49 times. You can adjust the size to whatever you want. The number of chains does not have to be a multiple of anything. I'll zoom through that a bit. Once you've finished your foundation chain, you want to identify the back bumps of that chain. So turn it sideways and find those bumps. Right under my thumb, in the light green color, is the first bump from the hook. You want to identify the second one, there it is. So insert your hook into the second bump from the hook, yarn over and pull up a loop. And do that into every back bump down the line. This is basically the Tunisian Simple Stitch, or TSS. You're going to do this 26 times for the dishcloth and 48 for the napkin. You basically just want to insert the hook into every back bump until you get to the last one and work that one the same way. So I will zoom through that. Here I am with a couple left and there's the last back bump. And once you've worked that, you're ready to work the Tunisian return pass. Start by yarning over and pulling through one stitch on the hook, then yarn over and pull through two stitches on the hook. And keep repeating that. So yarn over, pull through two, yarn over, pull through two, and keep doing that until you have only one stitch remaining on the hook. The Tunisian return pass is always worked the exact same way, so generally the instructions in patterns are given for the forward pass only. Here I am at the end with two left, yarn over and pull through both. Take a quick look at what you have. The Tunisian stitches consist of these vertical bars. The very first one on the right edge is always skipped, so we start by working into the second one. First we will work a Tunisian simple stitch, so insert the hook from right to left under the front loop of that vertical bar, yarn over and pull up a loop, keeping that loop on the hook. Next we will work a purl stitch. Start by doing a yarn forward. This is where you place the hook behind the working yarn and make sure you do this by swinging the yarn under, not over the top of the hook as you would for a yarn over. Next, insert the hook into the next stitch, letting the working yarn fall forward in front of that stitch. Until you get used to this, you might need to hold that working yarn down with your thumb to keep it out of your way as you bring the hook in front of the working yarn, grab it in a yarn over and pull up a loop. If we zoom in on that purl stitch, you can see the purl bump that is created at the base of the stitch by the yarn forward. 
Now for the rest of the forward pass, just keep alternating one simple stitch and one purl stitch. So here I'm working the next purl stitch. And follow that with another simple stitch. And keep doing that all the way down the line. As you get better at this, you will find that you don't need to hold the working yarn down with your thumb, as I'm sometimes doing. You, you may find you don't need to do that in the first place, but I know that when I first learned purl stitch, I had to do that. And as you get faster at it, you'll learn how to sort of create your yarn forward by using the hook itself and pulling the yarn where you need it to be. It does become very comfortable and quick over time, but it's awkward at first. So I'll just zoom through to the last two stitches, which happen to be worked as a purl and then a simple stitch. And as always in Tunisian crochet, keep working until you've worked the last vertical bar that looks normal. Then you're ready to work the Tunisian final stitch. Turn the edge of the work towards you slightly so that you can identify the two loops of the V along the edge. Insert under both loops of that V, yarn over and pull up a loop. That marks the end of the forward pass. Now as always, work the return pass by yarning over and pulling through one loop, then yarn over and pull through two, and keep going down the line until you have one stitch remaining on the hook. Before we start row number two, let's take a close look at what we have. The stitches that were worked as pearls have this bump at the base of them. To me, it looks like a scarf knotted in front of the neck. The ones worked as simple stitches lack that bump. They look like the scarf is wrapped behind the neck. So for the rest of the project, always work a simple stitch as a purl and a purl stitch as a simple stitch. Let's do it. Skipping the very first one on the edge, the first stitch we will work has no bump. It's a simple stitch, so we purl it. The next stitch has a purl bump. And you can see it there fairly obviously. So we simple stitch that one. In my opinion, if right at the beginning you learn how to recognize the purl versus simple stitches, then you'll always know what type of stitch you're supposed to work next. You'll know how to start each row. You won't have to think of this pattern as a two row repeat and remember which of those rows you're on. I think it avoids mistakes and it just makes it very simple. So keep alternating one purl and one simple stitch all the way down the line. Here we are almost at the end. I'll work a simple and then a purl. And regardless of where you land in the alternating pattern, always work the Tunisian final stitch the same way. Identify those two loops of the chain marching up the side and work under both. Then work a return pass in the usual way. Now you've probably forgotten whether we started the last row with a simple or a purl stitch, so don't worry about remembering. You can see that the first stitch there is a purl stitch, so you need to work it as a simple stitch. Then purl, simple, and alternate that down the line. So I think you've got it. It's very simple, and you're already starting to see how this beautiful textured pattern is emerging in the fabric. They look vaguely like honeycombs. They're sort of six-sided. So I'll skip ahead to the end and there's the Tunisian final stitch and work the return pass back to the beginning. I recommend continuing simply until the dishcloth is square. For me, I find 23 rows makes a nice square shape and around 44 rows if you're making a napkin. A trick to counting rows is to count the return pass chains that you can see peeking out behind those foreground honeycomb stitches. Each one of the return pass chains represents a row, and this is important if you want to make a second dishcloth or napkin and have it be exactly the same size. Make sure you do count the very last return pass chain, which is at the top of the work. If you want the dishcloth to have a little loop on the corner that you can use to hang it from a hook, make that now by simply chaining eight times. You can make the chain a little longer or shorter if you want, but I find eight times makes a nice length. Then attach that chain to the vertical bar on the very edge of the work that you usually skip. So that right edge vertical bar by slip stitch. Finally, to finish the project and make the top edge look exactly like the bottom edge, we work a slip stitch into each vertical bar across. I only recommend doing this for the dishcloth. 
In case you're not familiar with slip stitch, insert the hook in the usual way, yarn over, and pull the loop through both loops. Now slip stitch can be a little bit tight, so I do recommend after working four or five, just stop and take a look at what you've created. Make sure you're not creating a drawstring effect at the top of the project. You can compare it to the bottom and make sure the tension is similar. So if you're happy with the tension, just keep going. Insert the hook, yarn over, and pull through both loops. For the napkin, I don't recommend doing this step because we're going to work a regular crochet border around it. So I would just leave it and I'll show you how to do that at the end. So zooming ahead, here we are. When you get to the final stitch, as usual, insert the hook under both loops of the V on the edge and just work a slip stitch, the same as you've been doing. So pull through both. And for the dishcloth, you're now finished. Cut the yarn, pull it through, and weave in the ends. I really love honeycomb stitches for projects like this because the fabric doesn't curl. The edges and corners and sides are nice and neat. It makes a really perfect square. However, if you're making the napkin, the tension is a bit looser. So to neaten up the edges, I do recommend a regular crochet border, which means you didn't have to work the slip stitches along the top like we just did. Instead, you would have worked a single crochet into each vertical bar across the top instead of the slip stitches. Then when you get to the corner, work three single crochets into the Tunisian final stitch. This allows you to turn 90 degrees and continue to work a single crochet into each stitch down the left side of the napkin. Make sure that you always work under both loops of the chain that marches down the side of the work. Here's what it looks like if you do make the single crochet border. It does make a nice edge and rounds the corners off slightly. Make sure you work three single crochets into each corner and work under both loops of the chain around the bottom edge and up the right side as well. I hope this video helped you master honeycomb stitch. Thank you for watching.